Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to call this meeting of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources to order. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Black. Here. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Carlton. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblyman Ellison. Present. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblywoman Titus. Here. Assemblyman Wheeler. Chair Watts. Here. Here. Thank you. We have all members present. We have a quorum. With that, uh, before we get started, I'll go through a few quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, as usual, members, uh, please remember to mute yourselves when not speaking. Um, members of the public may participate in our meetings in a number of ways. Information on how to participate can be found on every meeting agenda and on the help page at the Nevada Legislature's website. Uh, you can find a link to the help page at a header on the top of every page on our website. Participants must register to participate and can submit opinion polls or sign up to testify. Written comments can also be emailed to our committee email address before, during, or up to 48 hours after the meeting. Uh, committee exhibits or amendments must be submitted electronically as a PDF to our committee manager no later than 4 p.m. on the business day prior to the meeting. Amendments must include the bill number, a statement of intent, and contact information. All exhibits can be found on the Nevada Legislature's website. Uh, we ask that testimony and public comments be limited to two minutes so that we can accommodate all speakers and get through the agenda in a timely fashion. Uh, and with that, we will move into our hearings for today. We have three bills on the agenda. And we will start with Assembly Bill 89, which revises provisions relating to wildlife. I will welcome uh, Assemblywoman Titus and her co-presenters uh, to present. I'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 89, and you may proceed whenever you are ready. I apologize, Mr. Chair. I suddenly lost connectivity there. So um, thank you for your patience. Um, thank you, Chair Watts and members of the committee. For the record, I am Assemblywoman Robin Titus representing District 38 in Churchill County and part of Lyon County. It is my pleasure to present um, Assembly Bill 89 today, which authorizes the transfer of hunting tags under certain circumstances. But, um, as many of you know, my family and I hold a tradition of hunting near and dear to our hearts. My parents taught me at an early age about the importance of hunting to maintain appropriate populations, not only to mention uh, the good tasting of it and, consume, and consumption, uh, consuming what we harvest. It is important to me to continue this tradition and to share my family's knowledge with others. Assembly Bill 89 addresses two issues. First, some big game tags cannot be used because the person who drew the tag does not meet certain requisite conditions for lawful transfer. Second, it allows for increased opportunity to mentor hunters who, uh, who are 16 years of age or younger who ha or have a disability or life-threatening medical condition. Some of the returning members might recall AB 404 from last session, which I introduced because a constituent had reached out to me to establish a, uh, a mentor younger hunters with a program to mentor younger hunters within the same family. Ultimately, the bill was indeed passed um, and um, sent to the Board of Wildlife Commissioners of Nevada Department of Wildlife to establish a program through regulation whereby a person who qualifies for an extenuating circumstances such as an illness or injury may transfer his or her tag to, to hunt a big game mammal to another individual 
refer use of the tag to the next season or return the tag to NDAL for restoration of bonus points used by the person to obtain. And NDAL stands for Nevada Department of Wildlife. The bill from last session was a good start. Assembly Bill 89, uh, the measure before you today, authorizes the Board of Wildlife Commissioners to establish a program that authorizes any person to transfer his or her big game tag to a qualified organization for use by a person who is 16 years of age or younger and who is otherwise eligible to hunt or has a disability or life-threatening medical condition. With the chair's permission, I would now like to put um, to my co-sponsor, uh, Mr. Kyle Davis, representing the Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife to continue the presentation and uh, discuss a proposed friendly amendment. And I believe uh, all members of this committee have a copy of that amendment that I included with the note that I sent to everybody. And it should be also loaded under um, uh, exhibits on our, um, on our agenda. So with that, uh, Mr. Davis, are you on? I am, thank you. Uh... Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Kyle Davis. I am here today on behalf of the Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife. So first of all, I want to uh, thank Assemblywoman Titus and the chair for sponsoring this piece of legislation and bringing it forward uh, for the committee's consideration. As Dr. Titus mentioned, uh, you should have a proposed amendment um, that is loaded on Nellis and was uh, submitted to the committee. Uh, it says proposed amendment to AB 89 at the top um, and has my name at the top of it. And so what the purpose of this amendment is just to clarify uh, one section of the bill as written and then also to adjust for a situation that we found after the passage of Dr. Titus's bill from last session that she mentioned. So when you look at the amendment, the first section, it says um, what we do there is we, we uh, further uh, uh, put some more definition around qualified organization, where it's uh, currently the bill says means a nonprofit organization that, and we add in, demonstrates in their application to the commission that it meets these criteria. And the reason for that is in, co in uh, conversations with the Department of Wildlife, we didn't think it made sense for the commission or the department to be put in the position of, you know, trying to verify information like, well, are we sure that somebody, you know, reaches 150% of uh, the federally designated level signifying poverty that you know that that's just that's beyond the expertise of the commission but what they uh, but what we can do here is ask that an applicant demonstrate that um, when they apply to be a qualified organization and then put that uh, that requirement on that on the organization so that's the first change that we have in the amendment the second one as you can see that other green language and what this does is to clarify right now as we read it the bill um, says that it is an either or situation or it, that it, uh, they must meet uh, both criteria, both um, uh, experiences for a person that's 16 age or, or younger and then with a disability or uh, the household income provision. But it's not clear that an organization could also just be an organization that serves uh, persons uh, with a disability or life-threatening medical condition. And that was the intent, is that it could be an organization either that serves youth with a preference for those um, with not more than 150% of the federal designated uh, poverty level, or an organization that serves um, disabled individuals regardless of age. So we wanted to clarify that in the language and hopeful that the language that we've provided does that. The second part of the amendment if you look at the second section, all this does is it adds in death as an extenuating circumstance. And this was always intended in the legislation from last session, um, but it was an oversight and based upon uh, an out legal analysis, it needs to be specifically spelled out that death can be an extenuating circumstance where a tag can be transferred among family members. So we want to make sure to clarify that situation so that the commission can account for that going forward. And with that, I would, um, with your ch permission, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Johnson, who can give a little bit more background on how this program could work in practice. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Please proceed, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, this is broadcast. Can you please unmute your Zoom call, please? The button in the lower left corner. We can, we can try that, okay. We can uh -oh. hear you, thank you. Chairman Watson, members of the Natural Resource Committee, uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in this presentation uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Larry Johnson. 
Uh, I've been heavily involved in wildlife conservation and sportsman issues in Nevada for over 35 years. Now, um, 13 years ago, I was one of the founding directors of Nevada Outdoorsmen in Wheelchairs. Uh, we take handicapped uh, outdoors to experience what many of us uh, take for granted. Our wheelchair hunters exhibit the finest attitude on life that you can imagine. There's no quit, no complaint, although they often live in pain and many have shortened life expectancies. We are a 501c3 corporation with directors located around the state. We presently have cooperative agreements with mining companies such as Nevada Gold and Ken Ross, as well as some ranchers to use their landowner tags for our hunters. We have taken our handicapped hunters on antelope, deer, elk, pheasant, and wild turkey hunts. Unfortunately, we have a lot more applicants than we have available tags. Uh, this uh, program um, uh, copies successful uh, law in states such as Arizona and New Mexico. Um, the one uh, things that we leave our hunts uh, oftentimes with tears in our eyes, but with a uh, such satisfaction that I cannot describe. One father stated at his son's funeral that our antelope hunt was his son's finest life experience. And just 10 days ago, I took a gentleman with stage four cancer, actually a middle-aged man, stage four cancer with an oxygen bottle on a pheasant hunt in one of our all-terrain wheelchairs. Uh, it's a wonderful program. The need is there. Uh, we urge you to support AB 89. Wish to thank Assemblywoman Robin Titus for her work on our behalf. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Assemblywoman Titus, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yes, thank you. Um, and I thank you, uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. Johnson for being part of this. This has been a number of years. And just to be clear, there. Um, Mr. Johnson mentioned um, the wheelchair program, but there are several other groups out there that, that offer um, these type of programs to uh, young folks. There's something called the Dream Catchers program, I believe, out of Winnemucca. What, what that is, they actually have landowners tags that they can then give to youth that are in wheelchairs or handicapped or whatever. So it's not just a, a single program. There are several in the state. So we wanted to make it open um, to multiple organizations because the, the role here is to um, allow those tags that are so precious to get to be used, whether it's your family member in a certain situation or to a special group um, to help um, expose folks to, to the passion of hunting that we have and, and conservation really, because my firm belief that hunting is conservation. So um, we heard um, we're gonna um, have Endal, I believe uh, should be on on the line somewhere, which is the Department of Wildlife. Uh, I know um, that we had um, early on in our presentations of this committee, um, Endel testified at the beginning of the session that pandemic that pandemic has had a huge impact on uh, uh, folks' desire to experience the outdoors. Um, and I think the bill as amended would allow us to expand our hunting access and give more poor, uh, folks opportunity to just do that and enjoy that. So I hopefully you will support this bill. And one other clarification, a member of the committee appropriately reached out to me and said, hey, does that mean anybody under the age of 16? Isn't there a limit? And I did get clarification to that question um, from the Nevada Department of Wildlife that you, you still have to ha be able to qualify uh, for a hunting license. And that would be up to the, the Wildlife Commission to set those programs. And um, so you have to be, you can't hunt unless you're, 12 years of age or older to qualify to begin with. So um, they did answer that question. Perhaps they'll be on the call for further clarification. And with that, um, Chair Watts, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Assemblywoman Titus, uh, for the presentation, as well as Mr. Davis and Mr. Johnson. With that, I will open it up to questions from committee members. I believe I have a question from Assemblywoman Cohen to start. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, Mr. Johnson mentioned having more people interested um, than having tags available, but can you um, give us an estimate about what kind of numbers we're looking at? 
and that would be for any of you for, because I know as Dr. Titus just said, there's multiple programs. Mr. Johnson. And this is, this is Larry Johnson. Um, um, through Chair uh, Watts, uh, we have approximately uh, 15 to 20 applicants for every available tag that we uh, are able to take advantage of. Um, unfortunately, some of our people apply with us year after year uh, before we have uh, an opening and, and they are selected. Thank you. And if I might also add a little bit to that question, and thank you, Vice Chair, for the question. Um, this, and just for point of clarification, it does not expand the number of tags that are available. The number of tags are set by the Wildlife Commission based on the number of wildlife that are available for harvesting, and that's how the conservation effort is undertaken. And so um, there's always a limited number of tags based on the wildlife uh, status themselves. So this just, that's one of the reasons it's so hard to get these tags. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for bringing this forward, Assemblymember Titus. Um, I remember when I met with Mr. Davis and Mr. Johnson about this earlier and how, how much it just, it makes sense. Um, but I just wanted to verify again, as what was stated in section one, that this would not allow then for the tag to be given to an organization that primarily represents disability uh, individuals and then allow for a silent auction type of situation. I just wanted to verify that and have that on record if possible that this is really just to help individuals who are, um, who actually do fit their criteria of the disability as defined. The way the bill language is, the bill um, goes, the, um, the tag can be given to the family member. That's that one aspect of uh, AB 404 that was passed last session on, on designation of a, who you're gonna give the tag to. And then this bill then designates it that it goes to the agency. Um, and then the agency picks the person that they're going to assign it to. Um, so that would be my um, comment on that. And then again, the regulation is set by the wildlife commissions. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Mr. Davis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you to uh, Assemblyman Anderson, I would point to the uh, the first, uh, number one in the first part of the bill where it says that the, ta the transfer is to an eligible qualified organization for use by a person who. So I think that's the important uh, line there is that the bill does restrict that it would be used by somebody who meets this criteria as opposed to auctioned off to benefit the organization generally. So I, in my, my read, and I would certainly defer to your legal counsel, but by my read, I think that's the important provision that makes sure that, the, that these tags would be used by those individuals. And that's how I read it as well. So I just wanted to verify. So thank you so much for both of you for that clarification. Thanks. Thank you for that question, Assemblywoman Anderson. Also, I just uh, received a brief note from our uh, legal counsel, Mr. Amburn, uh, and his interpretation is the same as that uh, provided by Mr. Davis. So uh, with that, I believe we have Assemblywoman Hansen next. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Titus and, and Chairman Watts for, I think you guys are on this bill together you for bringing this bill and uh, maybe just a question you maybe you address this a little bit I had some internet issues right when you first started your testimony assemblywoman Titus but just for the edification of those who might be new to natural resources perhaps uh, someone that's here um, could give us an idea of the numbers of tags say in a deer hunt that are available versus how many apply. I'm just thought it might be a good idea to give an idea of how, how limited those tags are. And they get even more limited depending on the species, like bighorn sheep, things like that. It might just be a good idea to maybe discuss some numbers to give an appreciation how these tags are, are coveted and then for an individual to be able to transfer it, it's, it's really quite a gift. Uh, 
Chairman Hanson, this is Chair Watts. If it's all right with you, um, we do have the Department of Wildlife on, and they'll be able to provide uh, some brief comments in, in neutral. Um, and I'd ask uh, I'd ask the department if they could uh, address that briefly uh, when they make their comments. If that's I think that's the best way to proceed on that particular question. Great, thank you. And that'll give them time to look it up. So thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you for the question. Uh, do members have any other questions for the sponsors of Assembly Bill 89? Uh, hearing none, I'll uh, thank you for bringing the bill forward. I, I uh, as somebody who got into hunting and fishing as an adult, um, especially appreciate the efforts that are placed on uh, uh, recruitment um, of, of young people and providing opportunities to everyone. Uh, I, 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 that's been discussed in the presentation from the department earlier this session, um, recruiting and retaining uh, new sportsmen and women uh, and I think providing opportunities, particularly to this population of uh, people who have disabilities is, is uh, well worthwhile. So thank you again for bringing it forward. Uh, with that, we're gonna go ahead and move into testimony on Assembly Bill 89. As a reminder, in order to provide testimony, you must register in advance on the legislative website where you'll be provided with the information to call in. Again, we ask uh, that uh, folks providing testimony, please limit themselves to two minutes so that we can get through uh, all speakers in a timely manner. With that, I will turn it over to Broadcast Production Services, and we will start by seeing if we have anyone to testify in support of Assembly Bill 89. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 89, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 742. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Emily Walsh, today on behalf of the Nevada Conservation League. We are in support of AB 89, and we appreciate Dr. Titus and the chairman for bringing the bill forward. Nevada has incredible outdoor opportunities, and organizations like the ones mentioned today offer experience for experiences for Nevadans that may not otherwise be able to get out and participate in these activities. This bill will better enable these organizations to fulfill their missions and insist the value and instill the values of wildlife conversation for more Nevadans. We urge the committee support. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We'll move on to the next caller and support. Chair, uh, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to any callers in opposition of Assembly Bill 89. To testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 89, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 092. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Hi, this is Tiffany East, T-I-F-F-A-N-Y-E-A-S-T. And I actually registered to, uh, to testify in support of AB 89. So good afternoon, Chair Watts and committee members. For the record, my name is Tiffany East, Chairwoman of the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners. The Legislative Committee of the Board of Wildlife Commissioners supports AB 89 and will ask the full commission to consider supporting it at our March 19 and 20 meeting. We'd like to thank the bill sponsors, Chair Watts and Dr. Titus for bringing this bill forward. We supported a simil similar bill last session and as a result passed a tag transfer regulation for sportsmen with extenuating circumstances. As you've heard, Nevada's big game tags are coveted. Mentoring helps to propagate our tradition of hunting and conservation. Over the years, we've had several community advisory boards, sportsmen and NGOs seek support and or petition the commission to authorize a tag transfer 
to a person with a disability or youth to introduce the sport to a new sportsman who has limitations and may not otherwise have the opportunity to enjoy and experience a hunt of this magnitude. Our committee asked me to remind you all that in Nevada, the recognized age for youth big game hunting is age, ages 12 to 17. We encourage you to vote to pass AB 89, and I'll let the department answer the tag questions that have been um, suggested. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. East, for your testimony. We will have your testimony uh, assigned as support. We understand that sometimes there are technical difficulties that come up in these digital meetings. So thank you for, uh, for uh, calling in and getting through. Uh, we will go back to thank opposition. You. And uh, BPS, can we see if we have anybody wishing to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 89? If you are just joining us, we are in opposition for Assembly Bill 89. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, it seems there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. With that, we will move to testimony in the neutral position for Assembly Bill 89. And before we go to the phone, uh, I will ask uh, uh, Director Wasley and anyone else from the Department of Wildlife who wants to uh, address Assemblywoman Hansen's question and provide any other additional uh, uh, information or remarks about this bill that you would like to do. Go ahead and proceed when ready. Thank you, Chair Watts. For the record, Tony Wasley, Director for the Department of Wildlife. Uh, the department would certainly uh, like to uh, express our appreciation for Assemblywoman Titus in introducing this. We feel that it, it's clear in the language that the commission would have um, certainly clear direction in, in developing a program. Um, we appreciate the inclusion of or consideration of some of the amendment language that's been offered and as has been stated and, and questions asked regarding um, the rarity of these tags. Uh, we quickly pulled some data. I've got uh, Deputy Director Jack Robb uh, here prepared to testify uh, with some, some of the most current data to express uh, exactly um, how that demand outpaces the supply for those tags. So Chair Watts, if I might, uh, Turn it over to Deputy Director Jack Robb to share some of the most recent data with you. Thank you. Please go ahead, Mr. Robb. Jack Robb, Deputy Director of Nevada Department of Wildlife for the record. Thank you, Chair Watts and committee members. Uh, the scarcity of these uh, op opportunities to go hunting is overwhelming when you hear the numbers. Uh, we had last year in our big game application period, we had approximately 80,500 people apply. And you can apply for more than one animal in a big game draw. So they put in just shy of 350,000 applications for what in turn is just shy of 30,000 big game opportunities to get in the field. Some of these, uh, I'm looking at a spreadsheet I have, 13,763 applications from resident hunters came in or 1,606 opportunities to take a bull elk. If you look at Nelson Desert Bighorn Sheep, 9,261 applications for 262 tags. Those are pure applications. When you couple in the people that put in for just bonus points because there's an express desire to hunt in the future, uh, on bull elk is 20,855 total people when you include the bonus points for that 1,606 uh, tags available and 14,421 applicants for desert big orange sheep when you include the bonus points for that 262 opportunities each year. Uh, pretty much everybody of those 80,500 people put in for mule deer. That's pretty much a given. And that's just under 50% of the total tags giving out. So uh, you can see there's a, a tremendous demand. Uh, we have a coveted resource. Uh, we have a quality resource and uh, to get these tags into people's hands that can use them, that's, that's what we strive for all the time. So if there's any further questions, I'm, I'm available with more data and more numbers if there's any further questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Rob. Uh, if there's nothing else from the department, then uh, I will open it up to members in case they have any additional questions for the Department of Wildlife. All right, hearing none. Assemblywoman Hansen has a question. Oh, Assemblywoman Hansen, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, should I go to Skype and ask the question, raise my hand? <laughs> I've had a day today. Thank you, Mr. Rob and Mr. Wasley for the information. Um, and, and just, this is not really about the bill. This is more just information I think is so helpful for those of us on natural resources to understand game management, which fascinates me. Um, of those tags that you give out based on how many apply, I think it would be interesting to just briefly, the reason the tags are limited is because you only allow for a certain amount of harvest of the population so, so to, to manage the population in a healthy manner, um, which I greatly respect. So maybe just a little insight into the reason the tag numbers are limited are based on herd numbers, if I'm not mistaken, that you guys keep statistics on so that you're always kind of keeping that tension of the harvest is in a healthy proportion to what the population can sustain and reproduce. It, for the record, Tony Wasley, thank you, Assemblywoman Hanson, uh, Chair Watts, through you to Assemblywoman. You're, you're exactly right, and it varies given the species. And we, we have guidelines that are uh, approved by our commission uh, that provide the agency guidance and in terms of establishing those quotas. And so if we look at bighorn sheep, for example, we have a, a guideline um, that sets uh, harvest levels you know, not to exceed 50% of the rams, uh, six years of age or greater. Um, we have male to female ratios that are uh, guidance pertaining to elk harvest and deer harvest and pronghorn harvest. We have ranges um, that we shoot for, uh, no pun intended, um, 30 bucks per 100 does, for example, might be a reasonable target, uh, no pun intended. For mule deer, um, an elk might be considerably higher uh, and it may uh, range considerably across the landscape depending on how local counties desire to see uh, those populations manage. We also have some female harvests and those harvests are typically uh, intended to um, be population uh, controlling measures. And so for example, uh, if we have agreements with the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service uh, in conjunction with the livestock industry that, that sets a specified number for an elk population, the most effective way to reduce that population would be through female harvest. We also have uh, bighorn ewe hunts um, to keep those populations uh, from experiencing density dependent uh, epizootic disease outbreaks. And so you're, you're exactly right. We have guidelines that are uh, approved by the commission that provide the agency guidance to establish those quotas and they vary um, not only by species, but by gender of species. Thank you so much for that. It's a, it's a complicated kind of fascinating science and appreciate the, the good work that the biologists and the department do and the commission keep good numbers um, and manage our wildlife in a, in a healthy way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Assemblywoman uh, Hansen, as someone who sat on the uh, on a county advisory board and looked through much of the surveys and science that went into this. I certainly appreciate the uh, the work that goes into setting uh, all of those quotas and levels. I believe we have a question from Assemblyman Ellison, briefly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Chair, I just want to get on the record: we're not going to be creating any kind of uh, uh, other tags. We're just allowing the tags to be transferred over to the other groups. So, uh, you know, if people that might be listening thinking, well, we're gonna, we're gonna add a bunch of tags out there, that's not the truth. All we're doing is allowing them to be transferred to another individual or another group. Uh, and, and is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Thank you for the comment, Mr. Ellison. Yes, that is correct. And, and was laid out by the sponsors. So that's right. Sure that's 
perfectly clear for the record. Do we have any other questions? Thank you. All right, hearing none, uh, broadcast production services, can we now go to the phone and see if we have anyone else wishing to testify in neutral on assembly bill 89? To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 89, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, that ends testimony, and I will turn it over to the sponsors of the bill to make a very brief closing statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate all of the folks who have joined me on this presentation. Uh, hopefully you can support this bill. And one last remark is that not all, I have a lot of points out there waiting for that sheep tag that I've never gotten yet, that I've got like 11 points there. And if I should fall down and break my leg before that, I wanna be able to give it to one of my kids. So I, I appreciate the, all the thought about this. I also wanna put on record that not all tags uh, are successful. Some of these hunts are actually only 50% successful. So taking that into consideration, these tags are truly precious. So thank you everybody for the hearing. Thank you for my co-sponsor and thank you for the, uh, my co-presenters. Thank you. Uh, with that, we are going to close the hearing on Assembly Bill 89. Thank you again to the presenters for bringing this bill forward. With that, we're going to open the hearing on our next bill on the agenda, which is Assembly Bill 103, which revises provisions governing the preservation of certain prehistoric sites. And with that, we will welcome another member of the committee, Assemblywoman Martinez uh, and her co-presenters to, uh, to present Assembly Bill 103. So whenever you are ready, you may proceed, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Watts and members of the Assembly um, on Natural Resource Committee of Natural Resources. For the record, I'm Assemblywoman Susie Martinez and I represent Assembly District 12. And I'm pleased to present Assembly Bill 103 for your consideration. So with me today is Mishan Eben from the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, who will also assist me with the presentation. I also have Marla McDay Williams from Strategies 360, who will be able to answer any technical questions to the committee that not regarding this bill. So Assembly Bill 103, which revises provisions governing the preservation of certain prehistoric sites, clarifies technical language from bipartisan legislation passed in 2017. Senate Bill 244 in 2017 provided that a person shall not knowingly excavate a prehistoric Native American burial site on private lands without first obtaining a permit from the museum director of the Nevada State Museum. However, a person who is engaging in a lawful activity on private lands, including without limitation, construction, mining, lodging, or farming, is not required to obtain a permit to engage in that lawful activity. With the chair's permission, I would, like, I would now like to provide a brief overview to describe what the bill does. Please go ahead. Thank you, chair. The museum director is required to provide notice and consult with the applicable Native American tribes throughout the permitting process. Prior to the passage of Senate B 244, Nevada Native American tribes were overlooked in how their sacred burial sites were treated. Assembly Bill 103 attempts to fulfill the intent of Senate Bill 244 by helping protect sacred prehistoric Native American burial sites. Statute already provides that a person is not required to engage in certain lawful activities on private lands if those activities are exclusively for purposes other than an excavation of a prehistoric Native American burial site. Section 2 of Section 1 of this bill clarifies that a permit is not required if those activities are limited to a portion of the private lands that does not contain the known prehistoric Native American burial site. I would now like to turn over the presentation to Mishan Eben from the Resort Sparks Indian Colony, who will provide additional testimony to this bill. Mishan? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was thinking Marla, sorry. Um, is Marla on? 
I'm here, but go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for your time and opportunity for me to present our perspective and thoughts. My name is Michonne R. Eben. I'm, I manage the cultural resource program for the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. The Reno Sparks Indian Colony is in support of the proposed legislation in AB 103. As the cultural resource manager, my duties include the protection, preservation, and, man and respectful management of Native American ancestral human remains, funerary objects, cultural resources, and traditional cultural properties. Our rich history and heritage have been passed down from our ancestors, many of whom are buried throughout the state of Nevada in their final resting places. The core theme of AB 103 is to ensure protection of our ancestors' final resting place, where they were originally buried, and to ensure Nevada tribes are part of the discussions and decisions made affecting the management, treatment, and disposition of Native American ancestral human remains. We believe that AB 103 is another significant step for the state to recognize that tribes too have a standing in regards to our cultural heritage. The understanding of Native American culture has often been reduced to a collection of unearthed artifacts with science providing its own theories and opinions and has much of the time disincluded Native peoples. There are snippets of appearances in Western TV shows and movies resulting in inaccurate stereotypes of Native life. Past Native culture is far richer and more complex than is generally appreciated. Native American remains and sacred objects were desecrated by early pioneers and settlers, but what remains buried throughout the state is still important to contemporary Native society. Our Native ancestral remains and items should be respected just as any other human remains are respected in any cemetery today. In Native American culture, when an individual dies, there are several significant aspects to the transition from the physical world to the spiritual world. First, there are certain rites and traditions that take place at the time of death. Then during the dead's journey to the spirit world and at the place of burial. In addition, the relatives that are left behind partake in important ceremonies for the loss of our dead relative. When the dead is laid to its eternal resting place here on earth, that is where they are to remain, to remain undisturbed. These same ancestors were buried in their traditional societies in a traditional way. These are considered cemeteries. The current existing tribal communities still carry on these traditions and we are very spiritually connected to these age old customs. Our dead ancestors have a direct connection to our communities, to the earth and to us as the living. Every year I've had several renal citizens call me and some, polite me, some politely offer their cultural findings on their private property to the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. And then I have others ask if we can purchase our ancestral items back. The latter part is offensive and disturbing. Our culture is not for sale. For far too long, Native American culture has been minimized, theorized, and placed on display. It seems that our culture is glorified and then it becomes a curiosity. Although AB 103 is limited to Native American human remains, there is no protection for our cultural items. And this is something we'd like to change in the future. We are requesting respectful communication with private landowners to identify any potential adverse impacts to our buried ancestors, and then to cooperatively decide the appropriate protection and disposition of them. Our spiritual practices and relationship with our past relatives has the same meaningful connection that you all have to your ancestors. Our traditional burial practices are no different from any other people's burial practices of the past or even today. All we are asking for is mutual respect for our dead relatives. Please support AB 103. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eben. It's good to see you again. Uh, at this time, Assemblywoman Martinez, are there others who would like to speak uh, and present the bill or are we prepared to go on to questions? I believe we are prepared to go on to questions, Chair. All right, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll open it up to questions from committee members. I believe we have a question from Assemblywoman Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Assemblywoman Martinez, for bringing this bill forward. Um, definitely appreciate the, the concept and thank you for the presentation um, by uh, Ms. Eben. I, I definitely uh, appreciate that living in a rural community with uh, multiple um, 
areas of uh, historic preservation in my area. I have a question regarding the comment regarding um, uh, cemeteries, and I was just wondering maybe legal could help us with this. Is it already in statute that a cemetery cannot be disturbed, whether you all, uh, by whether it's private ownership or not? I'm just wondering what that parity is, and and does it does it fall under this already that if it's considered a cemetery, um, and is that really what the designation? we need to say that this is their cemetery uh, and it would have already fall under any particular laws that we already have about uh, decimating or moving a cemetery? Were, were we gonna ask legal? Well, if you don't know- well, maybe uh, For that, unless, um, unless presenters have anything to provide on this, uh, I'll defer it to to, to legal to get that. And once we get some uh, response, we'll share it with members of the committee. Mr. Chair, if I can respond, this is Marla McDade-Williams with Strategy go, 360. Go, go ahead, Ms. McDade-Williams. I guess I don't have an answer specifically to the question, but what I would say is the statutes consider these areas to be prehistoric sites. And that's how they're set up in chapter 381 of the Nevada Revised Statutes. They go to um, previous uh, law related to inadvertent findings. Um, you know, if someone is doing a development and they happen to dig up remains, there's a decision made of whether or not those are contemporary remains or they are uh, prehistoric remains. If the decision is that they're contemporary, then it falls under law enforcement investigation and then, um, you know, disposition of those remains. If it's, made, it's a decision that it's prehistoric, then that's when the tribes are engaged um, to look for disposition of those items. So they're not included under the cemetery statutes specifically, it's prehistoric. Um, follow up, Mr. Chair? Briefly, go ahead. So um, just a clarification then, what determine, uh, when you say it's a grave site, like our cemeteries, is what well, if somebody was just to happen to die there because they were wounded as opposed to an official burial site. What's the distinction there? So there are ways to, uh, for the record, Marla McDade Williams, there are ways to analyze the remains to determine um, what their ancestry is. And um, in legislation that was enacted in 2017 and Michonne would have more technical, but um, you know, there was a decision finally to recognize that these are human remains and you shouldn't be conducting testing on them as if they were not human remains. Um, so there is, and you can still test, but it's not invasive testing at this point. So it really is an analysis of the area itself. Um, often um, when native natives were buried, they were buried with funerary objects, items that belonged specifically to them. So those are decisions that are made um, as the site is worked through to determine um, how it's classified essentially and to determine which tribes to to consult with. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Thank you, Assemblywoman Titus. And uh, additionally, uh, just a quick note from our legal counsel that indeed it is it's classified separately, not as uh, it, similar to what Ms. McDade Williams just uh, shared. Uh, they are classified as uh, prehistoric burial sites, not as official cemeteries and uh, uh, there's a statutory distinction between those two. I believe we have a question from Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and yeah, thank you all for the presentation. Um, looking at the, the new language, I have a question about the word known as a known prehistoric Indian burial site. Um, sorry, my phone's ringing. First time all session. Um, anyway, my, my, my concern is that we're using the word known, but we already know that in that around that area that there's a burial site and what does it take to be known? And is there any way to determine if the, the land that is being excavated now, even if you don't know that, that there are remains there, is there a way to determine if there are remains there? Do you see what I'm saying? So this is Marla McDade Williams. So under current law, if there is a finding, um, it's called an inadvertent finding. And under chapter 381 of the NRS, the landowner is um, required to notify the State Office of Historic Preservation 
And that office at some point catalogs that finding. They keep a database, they're, they're aware of where these sites are located. It's not a publicly accessible database, um, but often the landowner through that process of discovery or an inadvertent finding is aware of that site. And at the point that it becomes cataloged, it's known. Um, although known is in the new language, it's simply carried forward from section one of NRS 381.196. Um, you know, it's not a new standard for a landowner to meet. Uh, if they do not, if they're not aware of the site, which you know could happen in a sale or a transfer of the property and information didn't get carried forward that there was a site there, it could then happen again in an inadvertent discovery, in which case I believe it's chapter 383 kicks in for that landowner to then catalog, uh, you know, be required to work with the State Office of Historic Preservation to catalog the site. And at that point, again, then it becomes known. Okay. Follow up, Chair? Quick follow up, go ahead. Okay, all right. So with that language, you do feel that that's enough protection? Yeah, so um, Marla McDade Williams. So this particular bill just addresses the one section of the law that was enacted in 2017 as it relates to an exception. So at the time we had worked with the Nevada Mining Association, Southern Nevada Water Authority and Story County um, to ensure that if you had a 100, 100 acre property, let's say, and there was a known burial site on the Northeast corner and they were developing land on the Southwest corner that they would not be required to get a burial permit because they weren't intending to excavate at the burial site. So instead of this, what we thought was an exception language clarification, it got interpreted that there was an exemption so that a landowner didn't need a permit at all to excavate the burial site. So this legislation in front of you simply makes that clarification to say that as long as the activity occurs only on a portion of the private land that does not contain the known site, then they don't have to get the permit. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the question. Do we have any other questions from members for the presenters of yes. Assembly Bill 103? I have one, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mr. Ellis. Yeah, uh, say that, that you did have somebody that was private property. They didn't know that there was a burial site there and and they started getting ready to do construction and find it, can that remains be moved or does it have to stay there? For the record, Marla McDade Williams, I'll actually, actually turn this over to Ms. Sean. She has experience in those situations. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Sean, even for the record. Um, you know, um, there's a couple things that can take place. That's why in my um, testimonial, I talked about the, a collaboration and working with the private owner um, and, um, and deciding in cooperation with that private owner and the tribe that we make that decision together. What can be the most, most respectful way? And usually I just would like to say that we would like to keep in place. And so that when we say in place, it, that can mean several things. It could be within the same area just maybe put them down deeper or maybe even the private landowner saying, okay, well, I can move my shed or I can move my construction over here, another side. So that's the point of us working collaboratively together so that the, so that the tribe and the, the private landowner, they have that coordination and cooperation and trying to figure out together what to do. Thank you, Missy. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allison. And uh, I would also just remind them that uh, an unknowing would be an inadvertent discovery uh, and a different portion of statute would apply as Ms. McDade-Williams uh, indicated in her previous response. All right, any other questions for members? Seeing none, uh, thank you so much for your presentation of the bill. Uh, with that, we will now move on to testimony. We will begin with testimony in support of Assembly Bill 103. With that, I'll turn it back over to Broadcast Production Services to see if we have anybody in the queue wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 103. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 103, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
caller with the last three digits, 247. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes. You may begin now. Hello, my name is Will Adler, W-I-L-L-A-D-L-E-R. I'm representing the Pyramid Lake Pipe Tribe today. Pyramid Lake would like to add their voices in support of Assembly Bill 103. Uh, it is understandable and it should be understandable to everyone today that if there are any known burial sites, that the property owner should be working with uh, the responsible parties to make sure that those known burial sites are respected and uh, anything possible is done to respect those remains. Thank you for this bill and thank, we want to thank uh, Assemblywoman Martinez and uh, Considine for bringing forth uh, this bill. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Adler. We'll go on to the next caller in support. Chair, it seems that there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 103. To testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 103, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, it seems that there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to any testimony in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 103. To testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 103, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. That concludes testimony. With that, I'll ask Assemblywoman Martinez uh, if she or any of her co-presenters want to offer a brief closing statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as we had heard on the floor during the session, the second session uh, week of session, um, Native Americans have made tremendous contributions to Nevada. They even played an important role in the creation of our statehood. Native American burial sites are sacred and warrant our respect and our prote protection. I would also like to thank Nishan and uh, Marla for co-presenting with me. And I thank the committee for your consideration of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Martinez, for bringing this bill forward. With that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 103 and open the hearing on Assembly Bill 170 which revises provisions governing animals. And we will welcome Assemblywoman Martinez back to present uh, Assembly Bill 170 along with her co-presenters. Uh, whenever you are ready, you may proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, Chair Watts and the members of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. For the record, I'm Assemblywoman Susie Martinez and I'm pleased to present Assembly Bill 170 for your consideration. Um, before I begin, I would like to note that there are three friendly amendments that have been submitted and should be available on Nellis. With me today to present the bill and to discuss the proposed amendments are Jeff Dixon from the Nevada State Director of the Humane Society, Jennifer Ott, Director of the Nevada Department of Agriculture, and Greg Hall and Mindy Elliott presenting the Nevada Humane Society. Assembly Bill 170 provides technical fixes to Senate Bill 342, which passed with bipartisan support in 2019. SB 342 revised provisions relating to impounded animals, including impounds that occurred due to charges of animal cruelty. The bill also revised timelines, notices, and hearing processes resulting from impoundment. Horrific cases of animal cruelty often make the news, but we rarely hear about what happens to the surviving animals once the perpetrators are cited or arrested. More needs to be done to protect these animals. They need to be protected and properly cared for once they are removed from these unfortunate situations. Assembly Bill 170 is an important step in this direction. The bill requires a person who was lawfully issued a citation for certain crimes involving animals to be notified of his or her rights to request a hearing. Additional, additionally, the bill also clarifies that a hearing involving such crimes must be held in a court of competent jurisdiction. As I previously mentioned, there are three friendly amendments that have been proposed and should be available on Ellis for the committee's review. 
With the chair's permission, I would now like to turn over to Jeff Dixon from the Humane Society of the United States, who will go into more detail about the bill. Jeff. Thank you, Assemblywoman Martinez, for sponsoring this bill and to everybody who helped to improve it. Um, chair Watts, Vice Chair Cohen, uh, members of the Committee on Natural Resources. I am Jeff Dixon, the Nevada State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. Um, and as Assembly Member Martinez said, this is a bill that is needed in order to clean up a few oversights that were discovered in implementing the 2019 bill, SB 342, which was sponsored by Senator Scheibel and which went through the Judiciary Committees. Uh, that, bill, that bill dealt with two situations uh, where animals had been impounded and where their owner was arrested. But the first situation is when the owner is arrested on violations of NRS 574.70, which deals with cockfighting um, and related activities or NRS uh, 574.100, which deals with animal cruelty more broadly. Uh, the second situation is when the animal is impounded because the owner is arrested and detained for anything else, and the owner needs to be able to locate their animal uh, and either make arrangements to have the animal uh, picked up or to know where to go when they are released from custody. So section one, uh, of this bill deals with that second situation. In 2019, the law assigned, quote, the state, unquote, to create and maintain a sign that would be posted in jails, which would provide the information for the animal's owner to locate their animal. Uh, the state, uh, as it sounds, is not specific enough, and the, the signs were never made. So here in subsection two, of, so, of section one, the Department of Agriculture is assigned that responsibility. Uh, after the bill was released, we learned that that responsibility needs to be further divided uh, between the department who shall create the sign and the local jail operator who shall post and maintain the sign. Uh, that is covered in the amendment that Director Ott uh, is bringing. Um, section three, of the bill deals with that first situation where the owner is being cited or arrested on cockfighting or cruelty violations. Um, hold on, my cat has something to say and she doesn't. In order to protect the animal uh, from being returned to unsafe situations and to protect our government contracted animal shelters, from having to keep these animals indefinitely while the owner's case is being adjudicated, um, there was established a separate hearing which the owner could request. Uh, if the owner did not request the hearing or if they were found unfit to uh, reclaim the animal at the hearing, they would lose their ownership claim of the animal. A an issue that we encountered and after that law was enacted was that sometimes people would request their hearings, but then they wouldn't receive their hearings because sometimes there was no citation. Uh, there was no case and a court would not administer the hearing without anything like that to go off of. So here we have added citations and I've been in contact with Animal Control about that. Uh, Capital Partners has an amendment further clarifying uh, citation authority. Um, for, their, for the situation at Nevada Humane Society in Carson City, which contracts with that uh, local government. Um, and we've also clarified uh, that the hearing is to happen in a court of competent jurisdiction. I've been in contact with representatives from the court about this. Um, that term is used here because there are a lot of factors that determine whether it goes to a justice court or to a district court and uh, we felt it would be best to leave that to the uh, local um, local people. So there's also an amendment that removes some confusing language about evidentiary standards. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, preponderance of the evidence, uh, as I understand it, does not fit all situations. So we remove that and the court will use their evidentiary standard. Um, yeah. And then section two 
makes a change that conforms with section three. And that is the bill. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Dixon and Assemblyman Martinez for that. Uh, all right, with that, does, do any members have questions for the presenters of the bill? All right, going once, going twice. My video froze up a little bit, so I wanted to make sure I gave uh, everyone an opportunity. With that, uh, thank you for your presentation. We will now move on to testimony on Assembly Bill 170. We'll start with testimony in support. Broadcast Production Services, can you see if we have anyone wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 170 in the queue? To testify in support on Assembly Bill 170, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to anyone wishing to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 170. To testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 170, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits 045, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin now. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Watts, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Nancy Salmon, N-A-N-C-Y-S-A-M-O-N. I only became aware of this bill um, today, so I hadn't had a total chance to look through the whole thing. But I did have a question, um, and I did read it through, but what caught my eye was that in Section 1, Paragraph 7A, it says, as used in this section, and I realize that this is already existing language, but I had a question here, in that it says animal means any dog, cat, horse, other domesticated animal or undomesticated animal, which is maintained as a pet. Now, I own horses. I pay a livestock head tax to the Department of Agriculture on these horses that's as a livestock head tax. I have a registered brand with the state of Nevada and it is to be used on horses or on cattle um, as that brand is, is defined. Now under here, I and, and as I understand it under section 569.0085, Livestock is defined as all horses, mules, burros, and asses or animals of the equine species. So I was not aware that horse in this legislation is considered a domestic animal maintained as a pet. So for this bill, my question is, has horse been removed from the defini definition of livestock and become a pet? And actually, how is that consistent? Thank you for your calling in and providing this question. I will ask uh, the sponsors of the bill to follow up offline. Uh, we do not use testimony for a back and forth uh, debate or forum. Uh, if you have any other remarks in opposition, um, please do send them in to us. And thank you for calling in. With that, BPS, can we move on to the next caller? Caller with the last three digits, 252. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Yes, good afternoon. My name for the record is Chris Bott, C H R I S, V is in Victor, A U G H D. And I have some concerns with the bill. Uh, I have not been able to see the amendments. I've been online, um, but I'm not seeing them. So I, uh, 
one of my concerns may have been addressed with the amendment, and that had to do with the standards, uh, the evidentiary standards. Um, and I also did have a concern with the, the fact that there was no definition here in the court of competent jurisdiction um, language, and it sounds like maybe that um, has been addressed as well. I do have a concern still with due process with this bill, and I was involved in 2018 with the language of this bill um, back then, and so I'm familiar with its history, and it was presented at that time to be really only about those people that were put in jail that had animals that needed to be uh, cared for, um, and they were unable to do that because they were detained. Um, it seems like this has morphed into something very different than it was in 2018. Um, I am concerned in Section 2 with the expanded ability for rescue organizations to be able to seize animals just based on a, uh, a citation being issued or an arrest happening with no finding of guilt because by the time that case is adjudicated, those animals are gone according to this bill now because they have the right to dispose of those animals as they see fit, meaning the rescue organizations or the shelter. So I do have a concern with due process um, still with the bill. I also, like I said, did have a very big concern with the preponderance of the evidence because when you're dealing with constitutional issues with regard to challenging the legality of an action that the state has taken against you, um, that is a much tougher standard than preponderance of the evidence, which is only used in civil cases, um, as is a criminal citation or a criminal charge. Um, it is the state's burden of beyond a reasonable doubt. So I had some yeah. very much concern. If you can please about wrap up your comments. Um, Thank certainly. You. Yeah, those were my main concerns about the bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. With that, we'll move on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 318. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Caller with the last three digits, 318. You are unmuted and may begin. Good afternoon. This is Kendra Birchy. K-E-N-D-R-A-B-E-R-T-S-C-H-Y with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. Good afternoon, Chair Watts and members of the committee. I'm testifying today on behalf of my office as well as for John Pirro with the Clark County Public Defender's Office. As several members of this committee know, we had a very rigorous discussion regarding this bill last session and the changes that were brought forward with the last bill. I wanna thank Assemblywoman Martinez for meeting with us to discuss our concerns. Our main concern is regarding the standard um, and unfortunately removing the standard for the burden of proof does not alleviate our concerns, it only increases them. We had agreed in negotiations to have the standard of proof being by a clear and convincing evidence. And so as you should have seen on the amendment in Nellis, that is what we are requesting. Some of the other additions and concerns that had been raised at the last, uh, during the last session were because these hearings are occurring prior to the criminal case and these individuals aren't appointed attorneys in the civil case. We do not represent them. They do not have counsel. So we want to ensure that the person can advocate for themselves. However, ensure that whatever they say isn't used against them in the criminal trial. This has been done um, in probation cases through Cooper versus State. And so I provided that information and it's contained in the conceptual amendment, as well as it seems that there are some language issues with the bill that was adopted last session, which put the onerous on the animal owner to prove that they're the owner, which is very difficult for people to do if they are in custody. Um, so there is discussion on the record as to how that shouldn't be out in practice, but unfortunately it is. So we're hoping to correct that issue today. Thank you so much. And that's my testimony. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Birchie, and for uh, bringing some memories of the Judiciary Committee back to me. Uh, we'll go on to the next caller in opposition. Chair, at this time, there are no more callers in opposition. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to testimony in the neutral position. I believe we have the Department of Agriculture here. So I'd like to give uh, them a moment uh, to see if they have any comments they'd like to make 
um, and then we'll see if anyone has any questions for them before we open it up to everyone else. Uh, thank you, Chairman Watts and members of the committee. This is Jennifer Ott, Director of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I appreciate your time. I think our amendment is fairly straightforward. Uh, we are happy to run the lead on creating this signage as part of the bill, um, but we wanted to save uh, a little state dollars by running these signs all over the state and posting them. So we're requesting that the detention facilities are posting them and maintaining them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Director Ott? All right, seeing none, uh, Broadcast Production Services, can we please see if anyone is called in to provide testimony in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 170? To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 170, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, at this time, there are no callers in neutral. Thank you. Uh, that concludes testimony. And uh, uh, the, for the bill presenters, we did get a couple of questions that came in after we opened up testimony. So uh, I'm going to allow those questions to go through briefly. I think we have one from Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I apologize for not jumping in quicker to ask my question prior to the, the uh, opposition support a neutral testimony. Um, my question again is, is related, actually some of the, the comments that were made in testimony for or against, and that is to due process. And I'm concerned about the timing of say the disposal of these animals. And if a citation is issued, then that's one thing. But if they're arrested and found not guilty, um, then, then the person, I, I'm worried that will they lose their animals? Is there a potential that the animal could be disposed of? Um, even though that person's been found not guilty. So what's that due process there? Is, is there, will there be a delay? Make sure this plays out. Um, again, some of these animals are, or I think most animals are near and dear to these folks. And, and again, I'm not, I don't, I, I support the bill conceptually. I um, believe that people who are cruel to animals should again have, there should be some ramifications to that, but I'm just worried about the due process here. I could I answer. Whoever, whoever can answer that, would, is there a possibility that these animals could be disposed of um, before that person is found not guilty? Sure. Please proceed, Mr. Dixon. Thank you for the question, Assemblymember Titus. This is Jeff Dixon for the record. Um, yes, uh, to answer your question. The, the, the tension that's there is that the court process takes a long time and these animals can sit in the shelter for a long time. And as you know, in a rural area, sometimes these shelters are very limited in space and even the ones in our urban areas. And to have one or many animals there for a long time, it takes a lot of resources. And if the, uh, if the part, if, if it's, if after it's adjudicated, the, the person is guilty, then they're sort of on, they give up the animals anyway. What we wanted to do was to give them a chance to get their animals back separate from their case and to be able to say why they, sh they should get their animals back. Um, and, you know, that, that's what we came up with. This actually was an alternative to a, uh, to a process whereby somebody who was accused of one of these crimes in NRS uh, 574.70 or NRS 574.100, where they would put up a bond for, you know, say 30 days, and uh, then that would cover the costs of caring for the animal in the shelter um, to at least help those shelters out. But that um, we felt was, had a bias against the poor um, and that, you know, that would really, your, your ability to keep your animals would largely depend on your ability to pay for that bond. So we wanted to do something that was a little more income neutral and still protect the shelters from keeping these animals for a long time. So that's why we set that process up in 2019. Thank you, I have some concerns, but thank you uh, Chair Watt for being allowed to ask the question. 
question and uh, encourage you to follow up offline if you have additional uh, questions or concerns that you'd like to discuss with the sponsors. And I believe we have a question from Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair, for a second chance. And uh, it's good to see you, Assemblywoman Mar uh, Martinez, and uh, several of you I haven't seen in a while. Mr. Dixon, your cat made our day. So <laughs> thank you for being here. <laughs> Um, my question, um, if Mindy Elliott is still on the line, um, is in regards to the amendment um, that was offered up by uh, the Nevada Humane Society. In the addition of, in section one of the new sub six, where an animal control officer may, if employed or officially designated by a city or a county, prepare sign of service citation to enforce an ordinance of the city or county, et cetera. Do you, so are we giving new powers to um, animal control to, I, I'm not familiar if they issue citations already um, because it says may, depending on where they're employed. I just have some concerns about, you know, who handles that process now? Or are we now giving them law enforcement sort of capabilities that they didn't have before? I'm going to defer. Um, thank you, Assemblywoman Hansen, for the question. And, and uh, through you, uh, uh, Chair Watts, to um, Assemblywoman Hansen, I'm going to defer to uh, Greg Hall, who's on the phone and or is on Zoom, and he has he's a CEO of the Humane Society, and he can respond, and I can follow up with any questions. Thank you, Mindy, and thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Hansen. It's a good question. Um, how it relates to Nevada Humane Society and our animal control officers, um, by contract, we're not fully doing our job with our animal control efforts if we're not writing the citations. So what we presently do is we uh, go out and we investigate and we look to see if there's a basis for issuing a citation. And then we call the sheriff's department and have someone come out and actually do that. So what we're trying to do is um, not duplicate the efforts there and free up some resources for the sheriff. Um, but the question is good because it absolutely would fall under the jurisdiction of an animal control officer uh, were we not an independent agency uh, performing by contract. So this cleans that up. Okay, thank you for the clarification and thank you, Chair. And, and if I and, could- um, Go ahead. Yes, if I could, thank you. Thank you. Um, Assemblywoman Hansen, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Assemblywoman Hansen, we are the animal control in Carson City. We are under contract to provide those services uh, throughout the Carson City area. And unfortunately, because we are not employees of the city, um, it is, um, as Mr. Hall alluded to, we have to contact a sheriff um, in order to issue a citation. Because we're not uh, a officially employees of the city. This amendment would provide us the opportunity, rather than taking a sheriff off the beat, if we have an issue, then our um, staff could actually um, issue a citation on behalf of the city. And it would still have to be adjudicated, no different than any other citation. But um, it's, and it is only limited to animal uh, control efforts. I hope that provides some further clarification. That did, thank you very much. Thank you, we have one last question from, a, from Vice Chair Cohen. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, my question has to do with the rescue organizations. Um, it, do the, so, so are there any guidelines about what constitutes a rescue organization? Does it have to have a 501c3? Um, before an animal is turned over to it, anything like that, uh, just because I know I, I've done rescue most of my adult life and volunteering with groups and and there are a lot of groups that kind of come and go. Um, so how do we know what these groups are? This is Jeff Dixon for the record. I will need to get back to you on that. Assembly member Cohen. Thank you, I'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, please follow up with that information. If you provide it to our committee staff, we'll make sure that all the members receive it as well for their information. 
Uh, all right. Uh, with all of that, is there uh, any brief closing remarks that uh, the sponsor of the bill would like to make? Thank you, Chair. Um, just this legislation is very important step in protecting animals by providing technical changes um, in the bipartisan legislation that was passed in 2019. Um, I'm also still open to having any conversation with anybody who would like to continue the conversation. And I, I'd like to thank all the presenters. Mr. Dixon, if you have any closing remarks, you would like to add anything? Okay, well, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you everybody for your consideration of Assembly Bill 170. Thank you so much for the presentation of Assembly Bill 170. And with that, I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 170. That brings us to the last item on our agenda for today, which is public comment. Again, in order to provide public comment, you must sign up on the uh, legislative website where you'll receive the information to call in. We ask anyone providing public comment to please limit their remarks to two minutes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Broadcast Production Services one more time to see if we have anybody in the queue wishing to speak under public comment. To take your place in the public comment queue, please press star nine now. Chair, the public line is open and working, but it seems that there are no more callers at this time. All right, thank you very much Broadcast Production Services for all your assistance in making sure that uh, members of the public could participate in today's meeting. Uh, and thank you all to the members uh, for allowing us to get through three, I think, substantial bill hearings with questions in 90 minutes. I appreciate you. Uh, with that, that concludes our meeting for today. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday, March 10th at 4 p.m. This meeting is adjourned.